Today is Monday, August 26th, and that means that Reactor Magazine has released more Wind & Truth preview chapters. This week they released three chapters instead of their typical two. So in this video I'll be giving my thoughts on chapters 7, 8, and 9. Chapter 7 is titled Lost Blades, and that sounds kind of familiar. The epigraph of this chapter makes it sound like Spren are a lot less common by the time that Knights of Wind and Truth is written. This kind of reminds me of the prelude of Way of Kings. There's no mention of Spren throughout the whole prelude. This is a little odd because in most Stormlight chapters there's at least one or two mentions of Spren. So maybe this epigraph is a clue that things are going to go back to the way they were before a Harietium happened. Then we get into the chapter and this chapter is from Shallan's perspective. She and Adolin are about to leave with the Windrunners to get flown back to an Oathgate, and Adolin actually convinced them to bring Gallant along with them. He's going to ride on the back of Gallant while they fly. So from Rhythm of War, we had already seen that Reshadium leave an weird after image behind in Shadesmar, and they also glow slightly, but now that Gallant has a Stormlight lashing around him from one of the Windrunners, he's glowing even more. This likely has something to do with the Reshadium Sprin bond, but there could be more to it. Let me know in the comments if you guys have any theories on why Reshadium are so weird in Shadesmar. We see that Maya is progressing a lot and starting to heal it seems. She's smiling and interacting a lot more. So maybe the Adolin Maya bond will happen in this book. We learn more about how shard blades work, both living and dead eye blades. Living blades only return to Shadesmar when they enter through an oath gate with their radiant. Dead eye blades are different though. So the Deadeye Sprin return to Shadesmar to wander around every time the shard bearer dismisses their shard blade. We also learn that Deadeye blades that are lost in the physical realm eventually fade and the Deadeye Sprin return back to Shadesmar to wander forever. This happens when people stop thinking about them for a few centuries. Then we see a bit of how soul casting works in Shadesmar. Apparently there's levels to it. The most basic is commanding the beads to lock together in the shape of an object from the physical realm. The next step though, which is a lot harder, is to use Stormlight to recreate the entire object. And that type of soul casting is called manifesting. Vata's Sprint has a cool name, Mosaic. We also find out that Vata has a crush on Ishna, who is apparently an edgelord, or edge lady, and uses her light weaving to give herself edgy tattoos and black fingernails. Shalon has another interesting conversation with Kalek. He tells her that light, energy, matter, and investiture are all the same essence in different forms. And he tells her that there were once light weavers who could give substance to their light weavings. And Sprin could be made physical, even if they were made of light. Silidin stocks just keep going up. Shalon thinks back and realizes that she's made these briefly real illusions before. We see a type of Fabriel that we haven't seen before. It acts as a compass in Shadesmar, helping the Windrunners locate the Oath Gates. Shalon learns that Navani is now a bondsmith and that Urethiru is awakened once more, and they start their journey to the Oath Gate. But the chapter ends with them being attacked, but it leaves us with a cliffhanger. We don't know who attacked them. Then we get to chapter 8. Chapter 8 is titled A Coming Storm, and this epic graph is almost certainly talking about Shallan. They mention her keen memory and her ability to know the future without seeing it, which we learned that she has that ability from last week's chapters. And this epigraph also seems to imply that her demeanor might change from deliberate, concerned, and focused. Let me know guys in the comments if you think that this is referring to Shallan or somebody else. I personally think it's referring to Shallan. This chapter starts from Kaladin's perspective and he's preparing to leave with Zeth to head to Shinovar. We get some Nightblood dialogue, which is always a good time. Then we're told something strange. So Kaladin hops over a banister and drops down to a lower level of the tower. And the wind went with him. What does that mean? So apparently the wind is physically following Kaladin around now. That's pretty interesting. Based on the other preview chapters we've gotten, the wind is some kind of ancient spring created by Adenalsium himself. I can't wait till the full book's released. I really want to learn more about this wind sprint. Kaladin heads to the Windrunner barracks and he meets with Leighton. He had Leighton pack his rucksack for him. And another weird incident happens. Kaladin goes through the personal effects pocket of the rucksack and he finds Wit's wooden flute, Tian's small toy horse that he got back in Rhythm of War, and a rock. 
a dull brown rock. Layton tells him that he didn't put that in there. Hmm, that's strange. It seems like Cal stumbled across another one of Tian's objects. Back in The Way of Kings chapter 16, we have this flashback chapter, and Tian opened his hands to reveal a small stone, weathered on all sides, but with a jagged break in the bottom. Cal picked it up, looking it over. He couldn't see anything distinctive about it at all. In fact, it was dull. It's just a rock, Cal said. So Tian brought him a doll rock back in his childhood, and now it seemingly appeared in Kaladin's rucksack. Let's also recap how he came into possession of Tian's wood horse. So back in Rhythm of War, this is chapter 108. Dalinar connected Kaladin to a vision of Tian. And in that vision, Tian smiles and presses something into Kaladin's hand, a small wooden horse. He tells him, try to keep track of him this time, Cal. I worked hard on that. Then Kaladin drops from the vision and the wooden horse evaporates from his hands. But then later in Rhythm of War chapter 116, Kaladin goes to a merchant shop and he's rummaging through the items. He finds Rock's razor, some of Sigzel's brush pens, and a miniature wooden horse carved in exacting detail. He's baffled by this because he had lost that wooden horse that Tien gave him back in Alethkar. It was taken to him when he became a slave. He has no idea how it ended up on the Shattered Plains in a a merchant shop that he just so happened to go look through. So yeah, this is really interesting and seems a little mystical. Maybe the spiritual realm is connecting some way with the physical realm in these instances and manifesting these items. I don't really know, but there is a wob on this. The questioner is basically asking Brandon if Kaladin was just shown a vision of Tian or if he was actually connected to Tian's dead soul. And Brandon says there's two prevailing in-world theories. The most common is that Dalinar attached himself to the spiritual realm and pulled out possibilities and showed one of these to Kaladin. The questioner then asked where the horse came from. Brandon says that it's either pure coincidence or some sort of matching of fortune to the moment that ended up leading Kaladin to the place he needed to be, which is the way a lot of fortune works. He goes on to say, Some people would say he reached into the beyond and connected Tien to Kaladin via Tien's actual soul. But as Brandon has always said, he's never going to say if there's an afterlife in the Cosmere. He's going to leave it up to reader interpretation. So if it is indeed fortune that's leading Kaladin to these objects, it just seems strange that it would happen to him twice in such a short period of time. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. Then we see that David has an honor sprint following him around, but he hasn't noticed her yet. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, I know a lot of people wanted him to bond the sibling back in Rhythm of War. So I think it's pretty cool that he is about to get a sprint of his own. We find out that the sprint's name is Lucentia, and she's one of the sprint that Adolin convinced to make the transition to the physical realm. And Syl doesn't like her because she thinks she's boring. We also find out that the transition from Shadesmar to the physical realm is much easier now for Sprin than it was for Syl back when she made her transition. Things are changing. Then we get to Shallan's perspective and they're being attacked by a group of eight heavenly ones. A Windrunner squire is almost killed but Adolin's able to help by throwing some of the many weapons he brought along at the fused. After being hit by these thrown weapons a few times, the Fused loses interest in the Squire and goes after Adolin instead. The Fused knocks him off of Gallant and he falls to the bead ocean below. Shallan wants to dive into the beads after Adolin, but she's being held into the air by the lashing that Drehi used on her. She's able to convince herself to be Drehi, and then she sucks in the stormlight that was lashing her in the air so she can fall into the beads. I'm not sure if this is one of her Lightweaver powers or if it's something special since she has her double Nile bond. Then we get to chapter 9 which is titled Tossing Spears. In this epigraph we learn that Kaladin listening to the wind is the first key moment in whatever the author of Knights of Wind and Truth is writing about. I don't think the events the author is referring to is the contest of champions but rather something that happens in Shinovar. So this chapter starts from Kaladin's perspective. He has a strange feeling, a sense of urgency. He goes to meet with Scar, who is teaching a bunch of Windrunner recruits how to set up and break down a defensible camp. We see a new type of sprin, a solemnity sprin, which are apparently rare. 
It spirals up around Kaladin like a translucent gray-blue serpent. Then we find out that the strange feeling that Kaladin's having is because he's worried about Sigzel. This is likely alluding to something big. I won't go into details about it in this video because of spoilers, but if you know, you know. Kaladin tells Scar about his worries that he won't be making it back from his trip to Shinovar, but Scar kind of just shrugs it off. He thinks he'll be fine. Kaladin and Syl head to go tell the other members of Bridge 4 goodbye, and Syl apparently has some things to fetch of her own before they head out. Not sure what kind of possessions Syl would have, but I'm pretty eager to find out. Then we get Shallan's perspective. It picks up just as she crashes into the bead ocean. She kind of freaks out a bit when she first falls in, remembering a lot of traumatic events. But then Radiant takes over, and as Radiant, she's able to form the beads into a building-like structure and stand on top of it. Drehi, who who had apparently saved Adolin from his fall, drops him onto the platform beside her. This platform of safety Shallan created doesn't last long. Two of the Heavenly Ones sneak up on them and one drags Shallan down into the beads, forming a kind of cave around them. He speaks to Shallan, trying to freak her out, and he begins stabbing her over and over to drain her stormlight. Shallan seemingly swears the fourth ideal, or at least I think so. She speaks the same truth that she did back in The Way of Kings chapter 45, where she says that she's terrified. In this preview chapter, she says that she's afraid, afraid of everything, terrified of the world, of what might happen to my family. Most of all, of myself. I always have been. But both Pattern and Testament aren't around, so I'm not sure if your sprint has to be next to you when you swear a new ideal or not. But either way, she creates a light weaving of Radiant that has actual physical substance, and Radiant uses a shard blade to kill the fused. So is Shallan like a reality bender now? That seems a little OP, but I'm here for it. Those were just my thoughts on these three chapters. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments below. I'll be making these videos every Monday from now until Wind and Truth officially releases on December 6th. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you know when the next part drops. If you guys enjoy my content, consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron or a channel member. I'll link those down in the description below. And join the Discord server if you want to talk all things Cosmere. We're approaching 100 members in the server now, so it's a good time to join. That's it for this video, guys. I'll see you in the next one.